If you own an old Land Cruiser like this gem, then you've probably never had a speeding fine. So you can afford one of these. Today on the Skid Factory, we're going to show you how to turbo your Toyota 1HZ diesel on a budget. Welcome back to the Skid Factory. You might remember this gem of an 80 series from a previous episode where we took the shorty up the beach and may or may not have saved this from a bog hole. This is a pretty neat 80 series cruiser owned by our mate Josh. He's kept it like pretty much all original right down to the engine. It's completely unmodified. It's got these beautiful retro stripes on the side of it, old wheels. It just looks great and it's a bit different from your usual cowboy tune spec four-wheel drive you might see with every accessory under the sun. It does however suffer from the same thing that most 1HZs do and that is a complete lack of power. There's a reason for that as you know Toyota designs things to last and to do that they make them not put out any power which really makes something last a long time and this is no exception. These things put out about 75 horsepower at the wheels as standard and it is a big engine so of course it's going to last forever at that rate. They are really quite frustrating to drive because of that so the best answer to fix that problem is to stick a turbo on it. And surprisingly it's not that hard to do on these things. I've done heaps of them over the years with both aftermarket turbo kits and um, custom made ones. So. Today we're going to show you how I've done it in the past using a Subaru Turbo for a change. It's a bit of a thing. And uh, just some smarts, I guess. We're going to use our brains instead of spending money. Let's go. There's a lot of ways you could go about uh, turbocharging a 1HZ. The main thing is that you get 10 pound of boost into the end of it because that's what's going to make the difference. You can buy a, an off-the-shelf kit. They work really well and the ones that I've used, made in Australia, they fit excellent. Uh, there's there's a bunch of other ones you can you can also get um, that I haven't had experience with, but it all comes down to your budget. Uh, generally speaking, they are quite good value though. So um, the second thing that you've got to that you could consider is uh, an intercooler to go along with it. In my experience, the turbocharger makes. 50% more powerful and an intercooler makes it 55% more powerful but the complexity is much higher your fabrication that sort of thing so um, I don't believe it's worth putting an intercooler on it at at this point uh, you get all the gains from the turbocharger uh, it's very good value third thing is exhaust system this car we are going to put an exhaust on it the exhaust is quite cheap it was about 500 bucks for a three inch exhaust you don't need the exhaust at all you can just connect it up to with with some customization to your original exhaust system which is what most of the aftermarket turbo kits provide is just a front pipe that then connects uh, it probably won't make any more power from having the exhaust because the exhaust that's on it's quite reasonably sized for that size turbo but in this case what sparked this whole thing was that the exhaust bellows that comes off the front pipe it split and it's been spurting out soot for ages so Josh was going to get that fixed but we decided that it would be better value to put a turbo on it instead so here we are that's how we roll. Uh, the last thing you've got to consider is the removal of the sump to put the oil drain in. You can do it without removing it I've done that many times that's how it is specified to do on some of the turbo kits and it works very well never had a problem. It is a bit daunting though drilling holes or spiking holes in a sump but the thing that you really got to consider is that this engine's got 380,000 kilometers on it, and that's low for 1HZ. 1HZs have problems with, and 1HDTs, with just bearing wear, just from age. So what we do is pull the sump, clean it all up, weld in the fitting, and then we'll, we will actually put new uh, big end bearings in it. Um, they're very reasonably priced, and it just makes sense to do it while you're there. It's a known problem and you're also increasing the power and torque output by 50% on it. So it's it's obviously, if it's a known problem, it's probably going to be a problem in the future. So you're going to wreck your good vibes if you put a turbo on it and your engine dies 5,000 kilometers later because it was already worn out. This is the turbo we're going to use. 
It's a VF39 IHI off an SDI or an EJ257 Impreza. We're only using this because I know that this flange pattern is sort of going to match the exhaust manifold via an adapter plate because I've done it before. You can use any turbo you like around about this size. This is probably a 47 inducer, 47 exducer around about. So a 2860 Garrett, a TDO5 Mitsubishi turbo commonly used on them. It doesn't matter. We're not talking about a high performance engine here. We're talking about just getting it to go up a hill. So your, your fancy stuff, it's just not relevant to this. All you need is a turbo about that size because it's going to respond properly and because it's going to provide the boost and last. We've got a couple of extra little bits here. We've got a, uh, an adjustable wastegate actuator from GFB. This means that we can just change a spring and get our boost pressure correct without using pneumatic controls and that sort of thing. We've got a, a flash outlet there that's just something that I had lying around left over from previous projects to change it to V-band and the rest of it's just getting stuck in and making it work. Let's do it. Half of these will probably just snap off, but gotta give it a red hot go. There's always one that needs the torch, but in this case, it's all of them. We got the exhaust off and discarded it. I chopped this flange off. That's the one that goes onto the exhaust manifold. So that's our reference shape for the adapter that we're gonna make. So the two shapes are this and this. And all you gotta do is spend a lot more time than what you'd think figuring out how to overlay those two so everything faces the right way. So there's heaps of reference lines I've marked on here. Um, but there's a lot of things that that looks like it makes sense, but it doesn't. It's not it's not square anywhere, including that isn't square to that. So we had to mark a lot of lines and overlay some stuff and make some t templates like this. And this is what we've come out with. Um, I've still got to chop all the corners off this now, but because it's crooked on a square thing, it makes it even more confusing. So it it helps to write things like this is the manifold side and that's out facing towards the guard. Helps to write that on them so you've got a reference point of what, what you're looking at. Because every time you put it down and pick it up again, you'll probably turn it upside down or make a mistake or whatever. So we'll lop those off, uh, test fit it with the exhaust housing and then we should be good to go.
We've got the turbo all assembled on the bench, ready to go on the car, apart from the wastegate actuator. We've got the GFB uh, WGA actuator for an XR6 turbo that we're using on it. Uh, these have um, a adjustable spring pressure, so we are going to swap out the... It's delivered with 12 PSI springs, so there's three of them. We've got a little chart, tells you which springs to use for what um, base pressure you want. We're going to just shoot for 10 pound because that's all this thing really needs to, to have going through it. So that's just a single outer spring. We'll swap that over and bolt it all back together. And we'll be almost ready to bolt the turbo onto the car for good. We're making good progress, the adapter plate's all sorted, took a little bit of just thinking and making sure that everything was on the right way around, but uh, she's all on there now. I'm, this was something that was in my head from years ago and I'm, pre I'm pretty happy because it actually still works the same as what I remembered. Uh, it's a quite practical way of doing it really. Um, we did hit some snags with a couple of things. One was the GFB WGA, which means wastegate actuator. It was a bit big to fit in the space. It's, it is specifically designed to bolt onto a uh, Falcon turbo, and we were just sort of retrofitting it onto this, and it was just a little bit bulky around the engine mount area, so we, we um, removed it and went back to a normal little canister type uh, Garrett looking actuator. So um, that's all sorted. It's all working well. Uh, the other problem we came up with after we bolted the turbo on and we're looking at how to get the uh, the outlet of the compressor into the, the crossover pipe that's factory is everything on Japanese cars is metric. So um, they go up in five mil increments, generally speaking. So everything that we buy is usually Imperial, which goes up in half inch in increments or sometimes quarters. So that's a 70 mil and um, the compressor is 50. Uh, what we did was we found a 2.75 inch, which is close enough to 70 mil um, at the parts shop. So we've used that and I've made that little step up with the welder. So all that's sorted. It's ready to go back on. We'll put the air box back in, but first we've got to run these water lines. Uh, they're on the back side between the block and the turbo. So we needed to keep all that stuff out of the way. I've made them up already by length. Um, and they will go up into the heater hose circuit. So on some engines, you, you'll have spare ports where you can grab some water from or some oil. On this engine, there's, they're there, but they're not drilled and tapped. Uh, the one HDT engine, which is the same block as this, it's the same casting, but they don't machine this block to have all those fittings. So that's why we've got to add them, add them all in. The safest place, if you don't know how uh, the cycle of water works or coolant works in an engine, is to grab one side of the heater hose and, and the other return side. That is the cycle that a turbo needs. That's pushing out from the water pump and this is sucking back into the water pump and that's, that's the flow that you need. So, modified a couple of brass T pieces to put um, some Dash 6 AN on. They'll go, they'll chop into here and over there. We'll hook it up. We'll go down, rip the oil pressure switch out, put a T-piece there and run oil over to the turbo. That's all done up the top then. Then we'll go down underneath and rip the sump off. Woody's gonna slip some new bearings in and I'm gonna weld the fitting on the sump for the drain. And then after that, all you gotta do is fit up the exhaust and modify it to suit the new turbo.
How you doing there, pal? You holding up all right? You want a soda? As Al mentioned, replacing the big end bearings is a job that you don't have to do, but it is recommended, especially that this vehicle has 380,000 Ks on it. Josh has the record, the owner books from factory, so we took a wing to say that this hasn't been replaced before. So we bought a set of standard bearings. We'll just use some plastic gauge, throwing it up in there, and sure enough, it's bang on within spec. Number six, we pulled one off, and the bearing material actually had fallen out. So. I think that's what was actually happening from factory. They actually had a, like an unofficial recall on these to get the big ends replaced in from Toyota. So our mate tells us, Evan, thank you for the advice. So we're just gonna smash these back in with some bearings. I'm only gonna test the one if I'm happy with that. So long as the rest of the bearings have the same numbers on them, I'm happy to call it and send it. This is a bit of a daunting task, I would say. Some people get scared about doing it, but if I can do it, then so can you. So hook in, get it done. While Woody's sorting out the bearings in the engine, I've got the sump, I've given it a clean up and I'm gonna drill a hole in it for the oil drain. You can do this many ways, depending on what facilities you've got available to you. We've obviously got a lot of stuff here, so I'm gonna do it with a dash 10 weld on and just TIG it on, which is no big deal for us. If not, you can just use a brass fitting and just drill a hole in it and run a tap through it and screw that in with like metal mend or whatever. That's the way we used to do it when we didn't take the sumps off them and uh, it works perfectly fine. All we did was just overfill the oil, drill the hole, let the oil flush out all the shit, tap it and screw it in, then drain it, then clean it. Uh, never had a problem with it and it's the way that many of the, uh, the aftermarket turbo kit um, manufacturers say to do it. So it is doable, doesn't sound like the greatest idea and particularly because you probably should put bearings in it, you may as well take the sump off, it's not that hard to do. We're gonna drill a hole, pop that through, I'm gonna weld it mostly on the outside and then weld the inside for the full seal because it's much easier to get at and it's gonna be less heat.
The off-the-shelf exhaust is fitted up, it fitted pretty well. It is much larger than the standard system, so obviously space is an issue, so you've got to be a little bit careful about how you how you adjust everything and move it around. It's got a bit of adjustment in it for that purpose. We need to do some monitoring of this um, so Josh can keep an eye on it while he's driving it. The, the biggest killer of these things is uh, exhaust temperature. Well, it's not, exa not exhaust temperature, but that is what you monitor to figure whether your engine is about to die or not. So we went down to Supercheap and grabbed a couple of gauges, just basic boost and exhaust gas temperature. This is a, kind of your minimum for monitoring older engines where fiddling with that fuel screw makes it nice and smoky or you know you can impress your girlfriend by putting soot everywhere but that's really you're you're playing with fire as far as blowing holes in pistons and stuff like that and this is kind of the indicator for whether you're going to get away with it or not so it's a minimum standard whack one of these in I've welded a bung into the into the new bit of front pipe there We'll just screw this in, wire up as usual up inside the car there, and we'll be able to head off to the dyno and uh, see how it goes. Got the 80 back on the ground. We're nearly ready to fire it up. We're just doing some final checks. We've pre-oiled the turbo with an oil can just to make sure the bearings all got, got oil in it as it starts up because oil pressure will take a little while to come in. The oil pressure to the turbo comes from the oil pressure switch port, which is on the other side of the block near the starter motor. There's no other port for to get it from on this particular engine, so we have to pull the switch out, put a T-piece in, and then screw the switch back into one port of the T-piece, and then the AN line goes into the other port. We've got Raceworks 200 series AN on both the oil feed and the water lines on this, and 400 series on the drain. I I recommend you use 200 series on the oil and water lines uh, to the turbo. It's a very hot environment and they're, they're cramped up against the block for the water lines. So it's just, a, it's gonna be the most reliable product to use, even though you could use something else. So we've got our gauges all sorted. They're just been sort of put in the dash. Josh didn't want them anywhere that was visible and they're only kind of a, a, a glance at reference sort of gauge every now and then. So they're all in there, basic stuff, just power ground, illumination, so that they've been patched into some, some existing wiring and they're good to go. So let's fire it up and see how it sounds. Sounds good. Quieter than before. Everything's looking good, sounds pretty nice. Got that 1HZD noise going on about it. <laughs> sounds like a diesel. Uh, after, you've, after you've fired it up, have a quick look around. Obviously visual check for leakage, that sort of thing. Um, these engines will take it bloody half an hour to heat up because it's a diesel, so uh, the, the water side of things you've got to leave for a little while. We only lost a dribble anyway when we, when we cut the heater hoses. Uh, I also normally like to just jump under and pull the oil drain off the turbo if it's accessible, sometimes they're not, and just see that there's oil dribbling out of it because that's going to let you know that, that your oil feed is working. It's, it's the, the most practical way of doing it. One thing we didn't mention was I have welded a Raceworks fitting onto the crossover pipe here. In original form, that's where the oil breather goes to the engine. You cannot leave it connected otherwise you will fill your engine with boost pressure and all sorts of bad things will happen. So you can either just put the cap over that or because we've got the gear, I've just pulled it out. It's quite easy to get out and just welded a, a fitting on there for the, the boost gauge itself. So we have not added any fuel yet because we're gonna do that afterwards. We wanna see the difference that adding just even a quarter of a turn of fuel to that pump will make to the power and also the response of the engine. So. Let's load up and head down to the dyno. Shit. 
All right, we made the trip down the highway to see Chris, or Chappie as his mates call him, at Evolution Tuning. Last time we were here, I think we brought the patrol down to... Yeah, the Cummins, yeah. To uh, blow give it a run. Out. Yeah, blow some plugs out. Yeah, blow some plugs out, all sorts of fun stuff, but yep. uh, we're not going to do that this time. Plan is not to. Yeah. Plan is not to go that hard, no. <laughs> you know a bit about 1HZs, obviously. Yeah, you we play around with them a fair bit, so this is a pretty tidy old girl, so I think the uh, docket for today is to not go crazy. But we just want to make a little bit more power than they come with standard. Usually they roll 60 horsepower, give or take. If we can get 100, 120 in that window, I think that should be fine. 120, that's double the power, dude. Like, that is a... That's... Literally, and that's the biggest thing. If you look at percentage-wise, diesel tuning, generally, we don't make big, big figures, but we make big percentage gains. So if you look at this thing rolled in at 60 and you leave even at 100, that is a big yeah. percentage gain over how the thing came in, and it's going to drive way better. Yeah, just driving it up the highway even with boost but with no pump mods and stuff it's it's still so much better than it was yeah na so it's kind of how um, they should be from factory really yeah but maybe we'll see what do you reckon about this what do we do with this pump there's not there's not a lot going on on this pump there's there? not so there's a range of different pumps these things come with this one being the super early one it's got the very basic kind of pump on it later models have atmospheric correction later ones have boost compensation from factory we can modify them this one essentially we just want to make sure that it's not too rich down low, and once we're on boost, it's nice and clean so that EGTs will stay under control, coolant temps will stay under control, all those kind of things so that he can give it a pizzling without hurting it up the beach. Sounds good. Let's do it. You're in beer time now, mate. You're in my time. <laughs> We're halfway through it, brother. <laughs> That's all we thought. About 70 odd horsepower, eh? It's about right. So it's good, she's healthy. That's what it should be making. Now let's turn it up. Alright. Yeah, so we basically just want to loose, loosen this lock and nut off here and then this fuel screw. So it limits how much fuel the pump overall can supply. And then obviously regulating that is done by the throttle. So we increase fuel by turning the screw in and then we start doing some runs and see where we're at and just keep playing with it until we're happy. It's like, it's like making 999 horsepower. It's <laughs> so, straight away, second run in, we've picked up a bit of power. We can see we're still nice and lean, so we're still 20 to 1 off the bottom, 23 to 1 at peak boost. Uh, yeah, like 9, 10 pounds. So this is where we then talk to you, being the owner, see how much boost you want to run. There's always a point of diminishing your gains. The more fuel we add, we need to add boost pressure, but at some point, adding boost just doesn't fix everything. Okay, so... On a stock 1HZ, 12, 14 pound would be absolutely no dramas. Um, and that will allow us to then add a little bit more fuel again, make a little bit more power again. But like we said before, percentage wise, even as it is now, not gonna do slow maths on camera, but you know, you've already picked up a fair bit. We can still go more. I'd have no dramas dropping a bit more fuel into this and probably get it up into that 100, 110 mark pretty comfortably without even adding boost if you didn't want to. Um, and it's going to drive way, way nicer. You can see it's pretty much picked up everywhere. This is real narrow at the moment, but it's picked up power and torque the entire way. So I think we'll give it a little bit more of a tickle and get a little bit more out of it. Yeah, we can. So ultimately, Chappie, everyone should be calling you to get their car on the dyno and get it tuned. But if someone were to do this on a budget at home, yeah. how much are they turning that pump? What's the secret squirrel number? Really what you want to do is keep an eye on EGTs, okay? In a, in a perfect world, as long as our coolant temps are nice and stable and our EGT temps are nice and stable, you're not really going to hurt one of these things running nine pound of boost and, you know, giving it quarter of a turn, half a turn, okay? Um, if you go that far on it that the thing's pouring fuel out the back, 
and your EGTs are climbing through the moon, you're going to be in trouble. And what's climbing through the moon for EGTs? What kind of temperature are we looking at? As a rough guide, you'd like to keep them under 500. All right. Okay, so you're always going to lose 100 to 200 degrees across the turbine wheel. Yep. Gauges will always read differently, but as a rough guide, 500 degrees in the dump is, you know, a safe number to stay under. Um, and it depends how long you sit there. So you say you just tag 500 degrees pulling out on the highway, not a big deal. You're going up to Wimber Range and you're at 500 degrees at the bottom of the hill and you've got a 15 minute climb, your coolant temps are going to go through the roof and that's where you're going to run into trouble. So it's a guide, use it as a guide, but a bit of common sense goes a long way too. We've made about a 50% gain over when we arrived to now, which is pretty impressive. Uh, the car actually drove really nice. I drove it for a, a portion of the way down here and I thought it was, was pretty good for an old 80. So um, we're pretty happy with that. Um, intercooling, it's gonna be a question. At this power level and the fuel and boost we're kind of putting in it, it's not really necessary, okay? The harder you want to push these things, like we kind of mentioned before, it's all about heat management. The more boost you run, the hotter that air is, we want to remove that heat. You know, if, if we're trying to stay under 500 degrees in the dump pipe, and you're putting air into the motor that's 150 degrees, you're in trouble already, okay? At this level, 10 pound of boost, nice clean AFRs, this thing's sweet. So this is the sweet spot for a budget? Yep. Swap. 100%, that turbo's worked really well. The power carries the whole way up to 32, 33, which is as hard as you want to really rev these things anyway. Um, it's nice, it's on song, nice down and early. It's doing everything it's supposed to do. Awesome. So budget wise, we uh, we did a quick tally up and we were kind of working with Josh's budget, which he also just entrusted to us because that's what we do. But we really wanted to show that you can, if you're a home guy that wants to fiddle around with things at home, you've got the gear, like we are, then you can do this yourself or for your mates and it is a, a practical way of going about it. To put it into perspective, a good quality Australian made turbo kit is about $3,000 and then you've got to fit it and there's no exhaust and no big end bearings involved in that. We spend about $1,500 plus our time. So if, if your time is you in the shed drinking beers with your mate and you know, making some adapter plates then all good everybody wins so there's a there's many ways of going about it we've used all the best stuff that we thought was needed josh is going on a big road trip so we didn't want to let him down and i think we've we've come out with a winner actually and i'm pretty stoked with it that that adapter plate that i've sort of concocted in my head over the years i've got a little mud map of it i drew it on a napkin i'm gonna try and get uh, matt tomasini to draw it up for us and if anyone's interested in it, we can chuck that file up and you can just get that cut out, drill a few holes in it and have a go yourself. So, Chappie reckons the turbo is a good fit. Works really well. Pretty basic stuff. There's a bunch of different Subaru turbos you could use. So, um, seems like a winner. Thanks again, mate. It's, easy, it's always man. fun Anytime. coming down here and talking about diesels. Yeah, something a little bit different for you lads. We'll be back. I've got a few diesel projects on the go and I'm pretty keen. We're here anytime. Thanks a lot, mate. Too easy, man. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Hope you learnt something and enjoyed the show. And we'll see you next time. I would say peg it, but this on-ramp's got a corner. It's probably not great. Into it. <laughs> Insane. It doesn't take 20 seconds to get to 110. <laughs> Never has 110 horsepower been so excited. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> but how much soot do you require to impress the female? They don't position? actually. It's never actually. There's no standard of how much soot you need, but according to stickers I see on many D22 Navaras, it is a thing. Are you sure if about you that? have soot, you will get a girlfriend. Where are you seeing these stickers? Is that like 
Is this a Gabulture? Or On any D22 Nevada. It switch or something? Quality of I don't know. Females. I try to avoid D22 Navarras, but they're out there, and you can pretty much guarantee that's where you're going to find that I'm particular... I'm surprised you didn't take a chance to rip on TD42s, bro. <laughs> oh, it's too easy. There's a whole page for that. So if you had the choice between a TD42 or a ZD30, what are you picking? Um, probably a TD42, although oh, yeah. it's kind of like... which. Which burning pot do you want to jump into? What about a QD? QDs don't break because they've got as much power as a 1HZ. And then what about a YD25? They're not too bad, but it's way too small. You need two of them for... I need like a YD50 for patrol, whatever it's called. <laughs> yeah. I should have worked for Let's this. Hang on, what's the V9X? Oh, that's Renault, isn't it? Yeah. Is that... Not, don't speak of that either. Anyway? No. I mean, every diesel blows up for some reason or other, so... Everyone's got a story, but except 1H says with no turbo, they never blow up. <laughs> well, go, <let's> man. <laughs> like a honey up? <laughs> yeah, get a photo of me. <laughs> turbo upgrades. There you go. Upgrades. That wouldn't even come on boost. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. It probably wouldn't go up a hill either because of the weight. Time to do squats. I don't know what it weighs, but she's got some gear.